Thank you very much. What a great group. Really appreciate you coming out to join us this morning. We have quite a treat in store for us. Uh, we are privileged and honored to present John Chen of BlackBerry in conversation with Rich Carlgard of Forbes. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Before we start, some thanks are in order to BlackBerry in particular for their partnership and support in enabling this program, particularly Jennifer Deutsch. Thank you, BlackBerry. It is the mission of the Churchill Club to inspire and encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we endeavor to do this through the programs that we regularly convene and the audiences that we bring together. There are two programs currently open for registration. Next, we have Giovanni Buttarelli, who is the person at the EU who is uh, helping to rewrite the data privacy legislation for the first time in 20 years, of great importance to anyone doing business there. And then on September 24th, we proudly present the fifth annual Churchill's program which is all about inspiring us by highlighting excellence. Some of the speakers that evening will be Bob, will be um, actually uh, Andy Grove, legendary former Intel CEO in conversation with Ben Horowitz, and also uh, Ed Catmull, head of Pixar Animation Studio. So we hope that you will join us. Now, if you tweet this morning, please do use the hashtag Churchill Club and you will find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. So I would like to say a few words about Rich Karlgaard, who will then introduce our guest of honor. Rich is well known as the publisher of Forbes with regular columns and television appearances. He is also a best-selling author. His new book, co-written with Mike Malone, is Team Genius the new science of high-performing organizations already meeting with critical acclaim. What you might not know about Rich is that he is one of two co-founders of the Churchill Club, for which he was awarded a, an Entrepreneur of the Year Award by Ernst & Young. Please give a warm welcome to Rich and John Chen. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Uh, to answer the obvious question, I was in a bike accident in February and broke some bones, including a bone in my foot. And I don't think it ever quite healed properly. And last night I was walking with my wife uh, to a restaurant and something snapped in my foot and it, it seems to be back where it was in February. So um, uh, I wouldn't be here. I would have found a way, I think, to have uh, found an excuse not to be here if not for uh, my excitement in interviewing one of my favorite CEOs, John Chen. Uh, I've known John for more than 15 years. And one of the things, uh, as you're going to find out, John is, is warm, funny, provocative, um, and bold. Uh, it's, it, it takes a certain kind of bold character to do what I think is one of the very hardest things in technology, which is to turn around a technology company that has somehow lost its way. And John has done that at Pyramid, at Sybase, and now uh, he's taken on the biggest challenge of his career, a challenge that he didn't really have to take on because he's been successful, well compensated for his turnaround efforts. But he took on, I think, one of the most spectacular uh, turnaround efforts in the world today, uh, BlackBerry. And we're going to talk about that, uh, why he decided to do that, how, uh, what it's like to try to turn around a technology company uh, and chart a new course. We're going to talk about the Internet of Things because the, the future of BlackBerry really plays into this mega trend. And during our conversation um, earlier in the week, uh, it, I think it also uh, transpired that John has a lot of uh, interesting thoughts on what's going on in China, uh, which is a, a, a massive uh, ball of confusion right now to a lot of people in the West, uh, just the extent of China's economic challenges right now and, and how it's going to work its way out of, out of those. And John is um, very close to that situation. So John, um, let's talk about the, the challenge, challenges inherent in turning around technology companies and, and, and give us a little feeling for what you did at Pyramid and, and Sybase before we get into the main event, BlackBerry. Okay, um, thank you. Um, 
nice to be here. Um, thank you for coming and not having an excuse. When um, a couple of days ago, I, I I wrote to somebody and I said, you know, what attire should I have put on? And I never thought of shorts. <laughs> okay, I mean, I have to say, I mean, I I was thinking about tie, no tie, you know, like jeans, no jeans. Uh, shorts uh, that tops it all. So uh, once again, Rich had have outdone me. Uh, I've been interviewed, you know, I've been a dinosaur of the industry, uh, you know, I've been interviewed so many times, and interviewing by somebody in shorts, that's, that's also the first time. Um, anyway, a speedy recovery. <coughs> um, walking with your wife could be hazardous, as you could say. Uh, I have to remember that. Uh, so, okay. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> uh, you, you were asking about pyramid and side base. Well, tur right. turning um, around, the, the, the inherent difficulty of turning around momentum-based technology companies. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of, of pain. Um, uh, in, in, uh, so it's, it's interesting enough, every company is relatively unique. Um, uh, and usually is everything was going very well. Uh, usually you miss a trend. Um, and most of the time you miss a trend is because you don't take your competition very seriously. So like I know why Andy Grove is coming. Andy Grove is famous for saying only the paranoid will survive, uh, which is absolutely true. And you have, to, you have to really think ahead and say, you know, how does this gravy train end? I, um, what is it like? Um, so the great thing about us in innovation business is you could fall out of grace really quickly, but you could actually get back. You know, I will refer you to 1997 Apple, uh, and then you guys interested enough, you could, um, I, 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 I try not to talk about other fruits company that much <coughs> nowadays. Um, but, um, so, it really is about coming with a, a plan quickly and forming a team quickly and just have the patience, you just have to grind at it because um, like every turnaround, there was a lot of expectation um, and, uh, for people when you walk in and, um, and they also have a lot of opinion. Most people, especially your employee, think there's like one magical spell or something and, so, and something will just dramatically, dramatic, dramatically turn around and change the, the course. Uh, there is no such thing. There are no such thing. There isn't any such thing. Um, and when a company needs a turnaround, the execution engine is definitely broken. Um, you had good people who left. Um, you probably have to go restructure and get, um, unfortunately, some good people out of the company because you can't afford them. And then now you put a plan together, but you, know, you all know that even the most well-conceived plans needs good people to execute. And if you don't have good people, it's kind of a, a meaningless set of, of plans. So, so it's, it's interesting, it's challenging, it's different. Um, when I ran Pyramid, I mean, for those people who is old enough to know who Pyramid was, uh, we literally were like one paycheck away running our cash. Um, and, and then we did well at the end, but it, it, was, um, it was unique, because there was no stickiness there. Sybase loss. Sybase was actually out. I mean, Sybase. I remember in the uh, in the mid '80s, it was out in front of Oracle. Yeah. I mean, in, in many it, ways, it, had, it was it was leading Oracle in in fundamental ways. But Oracle just executed to a fairly well, mm. and and blew by them and crushed them and, and all of those things, leaving them for dead. What I learned, um, uh, you know, you, you learn this history over and over and over again. Uh, it's really about applications. Um, so if you look at how Pyramid got into trouble, Pyramid actually was, was one of the leading uh, Unix server technology company. Um, and what, how Pyramid got into trouble was when it was doing well, it started, it does well in its kind of the bleeding edge. Uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, promote Jeffrey Moore's thinking, but it was, it was doing well in the bleeding edge. Then all of a sudden, uh, when the mass adoption comes in, it usually comes from application. Didn't all do all that well with the application provider, the Sybase, the, uh, the, the Oracle, the Informix, the Ingress of the world, got caught and passed by by the others, like Sequence and Data General and HP, and you know, for those people who know what I'm talking about. Um, 
And if you look at uh, Sybase, the same thing happened. Sybase with, with Sun was the standard for distributed computing and the right sizing against the IBM mainframe world. Um, and it was the number one installation you know, in government, in financials, verticals. Uh, what it missed, it missed, again, the application because we didn't want to do the same thing um, that Oracle Informix and Ingress would do for PeopleSoft and SIBO and of the world. And, and then it just kind of lost the market because of, unfortunately, because of year 2K uh, phenomena. Uh, if you look at BlackBerry, the same thing. I mean, we do well on, um, on securities, on infrastructures. We're number one, and we have a lot of these good, good technology behind it. Um, but we didn't open up the API. Had we opened up the API, uh, I doubt very much um, Android is where Android is, and, and maybe iPhone would not be the I, where iPhone is today. So it's again, you know, so if you look at that, and even beyond my personal experience, you look at the industry, you know, uh, people who know old enough to know the Intel x86 architecture over a 68,000 Motorola. You know, Motorola has a more elegant architecture, but Intel won, well, because it runs Windows. So, uh, the, the beta versus VHS, beta has a better quality pictures, no question. Well, didn't have movies, software, obviously. That. So, you know, in, in, in any of our business going forward, we ought to really focus on, you know, the, 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 whatever the version of the application is and what customer or the end user ultimately see. So, that, that, those are, I think, the, you know, some of the experience I had. What persuaded you to take the BlackBerry job? Uh, <clears throat> uh, spending too much time walking with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's the talking part of the walking that's the... Oh, I see. I, I missed it. The, the hard this part. is the problem, you know. I've been married so long that we have very little to talk about, so... <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> And I hate the fact that she walked faster than I, so, um, and, um, you know, I, I feel this company, you know, I, I'm one of those people that, that really likes to root for underdog. I, I, I think there's, there's so much technology and, and is so iconic in the mobile industry that got to be a way to create a lot of value um, and, and, and get this company back on the right path. And, and it's, a, it's a huge challenge because, um, you know, we have revenue sources, the biggest re revenue sources, all dropping because of transition from old to new. And most people will say, well, this is crazy because your revenue just keeps sliding because you can. It's one of those things that I keep telling people, this is gravity. I can't stop gravity. But what I could do is to create another source of revenue that's still growing. So that transition we're going through. Um, uh, that really is about the challenge. I mean, honestly speaking, if it's just a normal CEO job or somewhere, like you said, um, I, or joking aside, I, I would rather be doing something maybe less stressful and, and, and you know, more control of my own time. And, and, but, um, but looking at the situation, uh, you, 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 it's interesting. Um, I turned the situation down three times. Right? And uh, until, until the, uh, the third time, and. I finally realized the reason I keep thinking and turning it down. Normally, if you don't really want to do something, you just turn it down, it'll be done. Um, and, and nobody will ever raise it again and, 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 and so forth. But, but uh, the fact that the, by the third time I turn it down, I start thinking, um, uh, maybe that meant something in the heart, maybe not in the brain. I mean, you know, you, you know mathematically on a piece of paper, it's really a, a very, very dicey thing to do. But, but, you know, obviously my heart tells me that there might be something here that I should try it. So the, 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 the good thing about it is um, I, I, I don't need this for the resume to find my next job. Um, and um, so nobody will hire me anyway. Um, so. Do you, uh, was part of the problem um, that, uh, I mean, Clayton Christensen and others have written about the phenomenon that you get blinded by your own success and uh, that that the iPhone would be a game changer was not uh, when it came out in 2007. Steve Ballmer said, uh, and I quote, uh, there's 
no chance the iPhone will become a significant player in the phone industry. So not, you know, a lot of people dismissed the revolutionary nature of the iPhone and, and Android at the time. But do you, think, do you think that BlackBerry was further hampered by the fact that it was in, uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, that maybe it had gotten a little parochial, that if it had been in Silicon Valley, it might have seen, uh, it might have seen the disruptive threat uh, sooner? Um. I, I, if that is the case, is a very minor, kind of a low order effect. Um, I think it might more be that it had been so successful and it was driven by, you know, uh, the founder who has, you know, very strong personality and opinion about what should and should not. Um, so the, the kind of the collaborative thinking model was not there. I don't think it's location driven. I think it's, it's just happened to be a company that had done extremely well. Uh, we, you know, um, even back to 2007, 2008, um, our company owned, owned the smartphone business. You know, you know, there were crackberries or names that, you know, that's related to everybody. Knows, you know, BBM was one of the biggest uh, messaging. Um, you know, we always talk about BBME, uh, you know, as, as a term and you know, everybody will understand what that meant at the time. Um, so um, I think we, we again, it, you know, it, it's more about losing the focus on what the customer wants. When you get to a certain size and, and certain success, you start really thinking about, I know what they want. And that, I think, is the first sign of trouble. It, you know, just, just listen to the market. Now, you don't go around asking customer every day, what do you want, what do you want, because that, that doesn't work either. So you do have to have a strategy that, that, that maximize your own strength, but there's a certain listening and, and not taking other people, you know, lightly. Um, it's, it's, I mean, we, we, we proved that. Well, let's talk about two components then of the turnaround. One is strategy, and then the other is um, when, when you're looking at a company that is in its uh, revenues are, uh, you des describe it as falling off a cliff. Um, things are uh, pretty dire. Um, a lot of people don't think the company is going to make it. Uh, who do you decide to keep? And what kind of outsiders do you bring in to inject new energy? Let's talk about that first and then talk about your strategy uh, for the company going forward and the Internet of Things. Okay, um, the side of it, to keep is actually, um, reasonably easy. Um, I think there are people that it's realistic. You need to get people that, that are obviously competent, but realistic and, and uh, have to share the same passion of fighting. Um, you know, not admitting failure. You know, it's kind of like, okay, it ain't finished until it's finished. You really have to have that mentality. And uh, now, does that mean that you know, we, we could identify that on day one. Uh, no, that, that isn't, that, that couldn't be. Um, and I, I apply the same management theory when, when I go into a, a situation as messy as this. The management theory, uh, the, the theory is as follows. You know, you want to have a set of people that you know that execute, that could execute. So we bring in those people. Um, now, um, there are, believe it or not, there are a lot of good people that would, have, would join a situation like that just to show whether they, they have the, the makeup of being able you to know, make that successful. Um, you want some of those people, but you also want to make very sure that you promote from within. Um, some, you know, usually embedded in the next couple, a layer um, that, you know, know enough about a company history and know enough about what really needs to be done. And, you know, the answer, uh, most of the time, it may not be perfect. A workable answer is already there in a the company at all times. I don't care what, what company we, you're, you're with, uh, whether you're doing well or you're not doing well. The people are like usually two, three levels below the so-called the C, the C suite. They actually know. Um, they know enough um, to, to, to do that. So, so that's another, another uh, a group of people that you need to recruit. So the combination of those two, um, are the most important to start. Then you start attracting, attracting, um, 
you know, talents in an industry uh, that, you know, you find functionally you might be missing. Uh, would you s describe Blackberry as primarily a Pleasanton company or a Waterloo, Ontario company today? Oh, definitely Waterloo. Um, we, you know, um, you know, although our Bay Area presence is, is, is growing pretty fast because uh, we bought a couple of companies. We announced buying Ad Hoc. Um, you know, that's going through the regulatory process. Uh, Ad Hoc's in, in, uh, in San Mateo. Um, we bought a company called Watchdogs, uh, do, do security um, file collaboration. They in Palo Alto and Israel, uh, Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're accumulating a lot of talents in the, in the valley here too. Well, speaking of security, that, that's a nice segue into the, the, the huge opportunity in the Internet of Things, um, because the Internet of Things will become a very chaotic world very quickly unless there's terrific security. Uh, if people can hack into your cars or uh, stuff like that, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, describe the opportunity you see and how you're pursuing it and, and why uh, BlackBerry uh, has an ad a built-in advantage here. Okay. Um, so let, let's start with how the strategy was formulated. I think that, that, that's an important. So um, in part of the turnaround is you have to have a strategy that is sensible. And anyway, by the sense of sensibility is, um, number one, that you, know, you kind of like uh, get a piece of white paper out and you said, what do I do well and what do I don't do well, right? And then you do the what you do well and do more of them, and then what you don't do well, you try to avoid. Um, and um, so you know, one other thing that, that BlackBerry does very well is on security and, and privacy and all that great stuff. So I want to capitalize on our to, turnaround. To the point where uh, President Obama, yeah. Chancellor Merkel, um, heads of state are still using yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have over 30 million subscribers still using our phones. Um, and, um, and, and the phones is important, but the more, more important is the server behind the phones. Um, and because that, you could expand that footprint relatively quickly. And, and so uh, anyway, so, so when we do that, and then the next thing is BlackBerry own a company called QNX. And I don't know how many people know QNX. QNX is a company that does embedded microkernel operating systems. All right. um, we are now embedded in about 60 million cars that's running around out there, 6-0. Uh, and this is the connected car application. Um, but we are embedded, through, uh, we, we usually get to the market through tier one, like the Harman, uh, you know, um, Denso of the world, which is you know, the one who created the entire dashboard and put it in there for the car. Uh, exception will be uh, going people like uh, Ford and, um, and uh, Audi, they want to do a direct, direct connect. So we would do our engineers working with their engineers and designing stuff into the dashboards and the new, the new cars. Uh, so you, you marry the security, the connected cars, you quickly get into the IoT world. Because the connected car technology could be applied to the healthcare industry, could be applied to the energy industry, could be applied to you know, security industries. Um, basically the regulated industries. Um, and so you look at the regulated industries and they have all the automations and things that are talking to each other, uh, exchanging information, exchanging intelligence, that is the IoT. I wanna make sure that we are very focused. We don't wanna say, well, I am in an IoT business. I'm, I'm sure that every one of you think you're in the IoT business in some form. Um, so IoT today is a big word uh, that very few people actually make money. Um, and um, so what is our value add? So again, I'm gonna focus back on, we want to be able to connect different endpoints securely and reliably. That actually played to the strength of BlackBerry since day one. Remember, we actually connect all the email systems uh, through the carriers, right? about eight, 600 some carriers into, through our own network operating centers um, sitting in uh, Ontario. Um, so anyway, so that's, the, that, that's what I want to play into. Uh, and and wh why, why regulated industries? I think that uh, here is where Silicon Valley, uh, not necessarily BlackBerry, but here's where Silicon Valley um, is not, maybe has not figured this out to the degree it's going to have to figure this out going forward because Silicon Valley has created a lot of new industries, but uh, now as it moves into transforming existing regulated industries, from education to healthcare to energy and so forth, huge opportunities. But, but um, 
but different sets of rules. Yeah. I mean, so why, why, why regulate it? Uh, one industries? practical, uh, well, actually a couple of practical reasons. Number one, that's, um, I could see that that's where the money is going to be first. Because it's easy to artic articulate the needs to the customers. Uh, number two, I can't spread ourselves too thin. You know, if, I, if I come up with a plan that all of a sudden I'm going to go do everything to everybody, to everywhere at the same time, um, I, I'm afraid that you know, before we accumulate enough results to strengthen ourselves, um, we, 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 got, you know, we got too scattered and, and then didn't end up anywhere. Um, so I want to be able to articulate exactly what we do for any, any customers. When I walk into the customers, I say, this is what we do for you and this is why you need it. Um, so we're doing uh, trials, for example, with hospital, you know, internet or medical things and connected everything. You know, in there, when I say that there's a lot of technology, you know, notice that I stay away from the technology. The reason why we uh, accumulate the stack, both organically and inorganically, is we wanted to be able to transfer file, messaging, data, alerts, um, securely. So we, we, we put all the technology in running, for example, a hospital. That hospital is also remote, you know, on ambulance and uh, remote workers and people that go out to visit home care and, and all that. So there, there is an a, there's an application there. I mean, I could articulate and then, then we could apply all the technology. I, I don't want to get us into, back again into just selling an infrastructure uh, speed and feed because infrastructure speed and feed, again, I'm going to miss the, tech, the application side of the equation again. So I, I want to be very focused on, on, on that today. And what, uh, Sybase, uh, you, you had a lot of, um, uh, where you were able to steer the company after its post, uh, you know, after lo losing market share drastically to Oracle, you steered it into uh, Wall Street financial services. Uh, what, what, what is the key to winning in a regulated environment? I mean, do you have to have lobbyists? Do you have, I mean, what? what no, um, no, I think uh, regulated industry cannot take risk. You know, we in Silicon Valley always like to think that we got the latest cool thing and somehow the customers like the JP Morgan Chase or Merrill Lynch or Bank of America or whatever will then just want to use it. Uh, well, you know, you roll out a new set of technology to a regulated industry, they have to be, A, they're regulated, right? They got to be audited. So, and then they cannot disrupt everything they're doing today like trading floors, which what we were in. So I want to I, I double down on that because then, then we could actually keep the customer, um, you know, believing in us and, and, and stay with us. And you could, then you could expand the footprint that way. Um, this is the reason why. And, and, you know, at Sybase, I knew quickly that if I, if I go after manufacturing, which was, happened to be the biggest sector on database, or retail, um, I will run right into uh, Oracle. And then, you know, Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft, you know, three names that you should not take lightly, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so it decided that they carve out our own space. And, and, and even then, they were all trying to come into my space, uh, so to speak. Um, and it, we were able to fan it off, technology, surfaces, everything that, you know, the relationship with that. But it's not about, it's not about lobbying. We'll soon open it up to audience questions, but I'm curious um, uh, why you're doing this as a publicly traded company. For example, uh, Michael Dell recognized that he had to make some pretty severe changes to the structure of, of Dell, and he thought the best way to do that uh, was not with Wall Street looking over his shoulder all the time, uh, but, but he took his company private. Why, why, are, you, why are you doing this under the, under the glare of... Uh, uh, public scrutiny? Well, I guess there are people who like pain. <laughs> Masochistic uh, <laughs> term. Um, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 for people in the financial industry here in the room, um, you, you, you know that, you know, it's not a question that I, as the CEO of a publicly traded company, could and should answer. Um, it's never stopped you before, John. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. If I have to advise uh, another person as stupid as I am uh, and doing this, uh, uh, probably it would be easier to do it under the private uh, umbrella. I would just leave it as that. 
Well, let's, um, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand and you know how the, the protocol here works. How does it work, Karen? You're, you're, a, a microphone will be thrust in front of you. Uh, raise your hand and, uh, and we'll get going. Hi, uh, I'm an engineer and I want to know how did you make the transition successfully from an uh, engineer? I know you get a EE master from Caltech and you're, you begin as a hardcore uh, engineer and you design chips and circuits, and how did you make the transition successfully to the business side? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a great question. I, um, you know about, um, I mean, it was documented a few places. You know my story of how I got into management in the first place, right? Because I didn't like the fact that everybody stereotype engineers, especially engineers from Asia, as gonna be engineer forever. Um, and, um, and I thought that, you know, if other people, uh, you know, of, of, of different races and genders could do, you know, management role, and I couldn't understand why, you know, there was a certain level of stereotype. So, you know, I, I worked at it. Um, you know, I, um, um, I, I spent time on, on, on working on communications. I spent time working on learning about, you know, management histories and lessons and, and, but at the end of the day, it's really about logic. So, um, you know, running a business is about logic. You know, the, the set of numbers tell you something of the past, okay? Understanding of technology tells you a lot about the future. Engineers have an advantage there. You understand technology. The question is, could you transition both at the same time or merge both at the same time? So, and people would think about that as both tactical and strategic. Um, I actually think the engineers already got the strategy part of it because they understand the technology, pay attention to where the market's going. Um, and, you know, engineers tend to be more introvert, maybe is the right word. Um, it needs to be a little bit more, you know, extend its, uh, you know, the person's out, outside um, and, and listen to people. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't have to follow what everybody said, but you gotta, you gotta pay attention to everything's around you. So some, things, some of these things are personality driven, um, I would say. Um, I, always, I like people and I like dealing with people and um, so those, those two combination. I actually think that I'm always at the advantage, right? Um, because, because of the fact that I understand technology, I don't have to work at it as much. And you, really, you made this transition into management at Siemens, right? Well, you, uh, no, at, at, at Burroughs. Okay. At Burroughs. Then I became Unisys, then I went to Pyramid through the route of Sequoia, so to speak, you know, um, and, um, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then sold Pyramid to Siemens, went to Sybase, sold to SAP. I'm running our German companies to buy us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Primesberger with eWeek. Uh, Mr. Chen, could you characterize BlackBerry's relationship with Android at this time? And I understand through some channels that it's possible BlackBerry may be using or, or, or pr producing a phone or a device that will be running Android in the future. Is that true or false? Well, I read a leak. Uh, <laughs> that supposedly I'm working on some kind of an Android phone. Um, it's first of all, uh, it, it, remember I mentioned QNX earlier about the embedded microkernel technology? Actually came from Linux. So what it does is it, 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 it's a microkernel version of Linux. That's where the security comes in. And there's a lot of policy uh, input into the how you modulize that. And this is why we have the most secure Linux. Well, turns out Android came from the Linux source, open source also. So, um, it's, so it's very easy for us to put together a Android runtime uh, engine. Um, and we did it and put it on the BB10, as you all know. BB10 actually came, our BlackBerry 10, the latest operating system, uh, actually came from QNX, all right? So you can see the, 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 the foundation is the same. It just happened that we are the more secure version of that. Um, so running an Android operating environment um, it's not a uh, application. It's not really hard for us to do. Um, you know, the rest you have to read it from the rumor blog. 
Next question. Mr. Chen, good morning. Good morning. Most people, when they, today if you ask them about BlackBerry, they still view BlackBerry as a handset devices company. Um, whereas you are, you know, we already see you transitioning that to a high growth enterprise, end-to-end uh, -end secure mobility software company. When you talk to your customers you're in the enterprise of CIOs, do they see BlackBerry as a devices company or they do see a high growth uh, enterprise software company? Oh, interesting, very good, thank you. Um, so uh, let me turn it around a little differently. Most people doesn't understand why we're still in the handset business. Uh, and, and, you know, and I explain it time after time, there, 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 there's, a, there's a really strong technical reasons for it, and there's a business reason for it, and then there are also some, some uh, KPIs around it, okay? The, the technical reasons for it, the strong technical reasons for it is, you know, we are trying to build an end-to-end -end secure uh, environment, right? End-to-end -end meaning that you have to have the device secure. Forget about a handset for a second. Just think about a device, right? So let's suppose that I put a device on a truck as a tracker. Right? It, 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 it transmits through the LTE, location, status, whatever it is. If I dip a sensor into the water, it transmits. Uh, you know, on, on LTE, it won't be 2G, 3G anymore. It's got to be right. So, so the so so the point is, we have to be in the device business in order to provide the solution. We talk about whether it's a medical world, matter. You know. So now the question is, what about a phone? Well, phone is a derivative of a device. It happened to today. You know it. So a lot of people ask me about this phone business. Now the phone business um, is it's the you know our day to day interaction tools and, and as you know the phone is getting to be more powerful and more personal at times goes on. So we think there's a lot of business to be able to secure securitize the phone. There's a lot of business to provide you the privacy, although you know today's world people didn't feel like they need to pay for it, but they will. I mean this is this is coming. And that played to our strength. And so now I have an end to end personal communication environment that tie you back into the work environment. So if you look through that, all the technology that we've been working on is that. Now, are we executing flawlessly, you know, whatever? Not yet, but, but that big picture and the big direction is definitely that. That's why in the phone business. Now, the question then becomes, how long are you gonna stay in the phone business if you can't make money? Now, Ina and I was talking a little earlier, there were like at least 200 <laughs> phone manufacturers out there, and uh, my, my buddy John Scully just, uh, Announced yet another one this week uh, called OB, 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 right? OB phone, right? Uh, and you know, and I read lately, you know, the the Novo, uh, because of Motorola, they they now release a phone uh, under 199 bucks to try to fight with uh, Xiaomi and all that good stuff. Really, really high quality spec, you know, from a spec perspective, right? So I have to come at a, a, a from a software side now. If I can make money off the phone, okay, there's a timeline. I'm not going to tell you when, but if I can make money on the phone. Uh, I will be out of that handset, telephone handset business, but I will never get out of the telephone business um, uh, in terms of software. Uh, if that, if, I hope I make sense to you. I, and because when you go into the IoT world, you really do have to have point-to-point -point connect. So I, you could just do the server, you just do the server and the messaging, that's, just not, that's not enough as an application. That is enough to, as a component. I, I said earlier that if for this company to continue to create iconic values, you gotta have to be in, in an end-to-end -end app space. Well, does the BlackBerry name, is that an asset or a liability for you? Because uh, as the questioner asked, yeah. you know, it does create confusion, um, at least, uh, at least uh, uh, in the media and, and, and kind of the popular perception, and perhaps even the Wall Street perception. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, I, you know, that's something that I thought about all the time because when I spoke to customers, precisely what you just said, people just automatic, automatically assume you're in the phone business and then, and, then, then, and then they find out that you're not doing that well in the phone business and therefore, by definition, you're not doing that well as a company, so they kind of, you know, miss the point about everything else you want to talk about. Uh, now, um, it is my belief, you're, you're in better shape, you, 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 you advise a lot of management on things um, to, to, to decide, uh, to have a, a better opinion on this. It is my belief that you never change name when, uh, an identity 
or project a new identity when you're not doing well. When you're not doing well, you change name is it, like a little bit gimmicky, okay? Because the fundamental hasn't changed. And so what does that mean, right? Um, so I would say, this is like I told people, I told, if a lot of my marketing people would like to have this discussion. I kind of put a stop to it very, very soon. It's like if my kid, and if your kid is not doing well at school, you know, let's call him Johnny, will you then one day say, you're not doing well at school, I'm gonna call you Ricky. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna to go to school and change all the transcript, you're Ricky. You think that mysteriously Ricky is now doing well in school? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so I think the thing you ought to do is when you do well and people say, okay, this is now an established company, let's see what they do that are interesting. Okay. And you actually could deliver that. It's not out of question that we could create a spin-off in an entire business that, let's say, you know, Hospital Automation Inc., whatever they call it. I mean, I'm making it up as I go. Uh, and I think this is, um, it's timing. I, I, I don't want to describe a new, new name. You know, I got friends to change. You, you folks have been around long enough to understand, you know, SEO changed to SEO. Uh, send a cruise operation and change it back to SEO. Did it help? I, there are others that still exist and I'm not gonna say anything. Because I'm gonna get hate mail uh, if I do. But anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Next question. Richard Bliss uh, with NetApp. Rich, John, thanks for being here. Hi. BlackBerry in the past has uh, often gone it alone on a lot of initiatives that they've done. And it sounds like from your philosophy, you've uh, you're bringing a, a new, more embraceive culture to uh, BlackBerry of looking and doing this Internet of Things with, uh, with an ecosystem rather than as a, a singular approach on your own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know whether, uh, you know, one of the more, quote unquote, uh, a, a, a good, good example um, uh, is was that, that we were able to convince Samsung uh, to use our server to manage the Knox device. Now, if you sit back and think about what in the world you're doing, because Knox device is actually a direct competitor of my, of my high-end regulated industry film business. Uh, we did the same thing with Black Phone at Boeing. So now our best, you know, the and enterprise server, the software, are able to manage both the Knox device and the, and so a lot of time, and, and it, by the way, drives my handset people crazy, is we have deals that, that that my sales guys on the software server side is pitching not our servers with the Samsung device. So, um, absolutely. I mean, I think in the ecosystem, this is, uh, I, you, if you really wanted to play, play in a bigger market, you, you gotta have to be cross-platform, you gotta have partners. Um, and otherwise, otherwise, it, you know, you go away. And, and um, I caution every, anybody in the industry that focus on they want it all. It, it never happened. We, we had it all. One, one misstep, you will lose it all. John, I wanted to segue into um, your thoughts about China since so many of us um, are, uh, do business in China and are trying to figure out whether this crisis in China is a, is a very serious one with uh, potential of, um, of China losing its momentum on growth, perhaps even creating a, a, you know, instability in the society, or is this a, a temporary phenomenon uh, along the way to more years of 7 and 8 percent growth? Well, um, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm kind of a China, I mean, a lot of our interaction is through the... <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen you more in the Far East, I think, than, yeah. than here. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, you know, on Singapore. I and my colleagues keep running into John in Singapore uh, and Hong Kong. I mean, it's amazing. You, yeah. must, li you must, like, hang out in hotel lobbies. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. I, I, I'm, I'm, I hang out in a hotel lobby looking for food and business. Um, <laughs> um, so think about, I think this is what's happening in, in my personal opinion, so I can't, I'm not speaking as an expert, but my personal opinion is perfectly understandable and is good for the future. So the question is, what is actually happening, right? What's happening is 
that um, the China market is reflecting the slower growth. That's what, that's what is really happening. And then all the other tension and everything around it, that whatever it is. Right? But, um, so if you think about a Silicon Valley company, um, you, know, you have a, a startup company that was able to grow 80%, 100% year over year. And you could grow it for a little while, and then the company become very big. Um, let's just take uh, Oracle, for example. You know, now, I, I, Oracle wouldn't be able to grow 83%, 100% year over year because of sheer, the sheer size. Okay? That doesn't mean Oracle is a bad company. That doesn't mean, I mean Oracle is going to go away. Um, so I think we've got to be put in the right perspective. That's, that's number one. Number two, perfect opportunity to shake out the, uh, the, the weak versus the stronger company. And, and you ought to. You, this ought to happen because if it, do, if it doesn't happen, uh, you know, there's a, uh, then, then there is a um, structurally damage to the economy because where they are harboring the not so strong company, i.e., a lot of time the SOE, the stable enterprise. So um, recognizing that that change um, will allow them eventually to drive to more market-driven pricing. When they drive to more market-driven pricing, it will allow them to get into the so-called XDR, the, uh, the, the, the IMF definition of the currency basket. When that happened, um, I think China uh, not only status, but I think the economy it will pick up. Um, and the structure of the economy will be much more sound. So uh, going through this process could be painful, um, but I see nothing wrong. So put the right last point about perspective, put it in perspective. The China market drop in the last 30 days only give back what they gained from the beginning of the year. They're back to 2014 level. So is that a, oh my God, you know, let's jump out a window. I don't think so. If you look, you, you look at their charts, um, I, st I think there's still a lot of problems at this level. It, it, I don't think it's truly reflective. Of the, I think it's overvaluing what the business are today. Well, we in the West uh, look at China and we see a country where it's really difficult to f uh, discern whether they are really moving forward where uh, Xi Jinping is a, a real reformer or whether he's panicking and going backwards uh, because when you look at the increased press restrictions um, there there is no mention of the Chinese stock market in the uh, in the communist approved newspapers in China right it's forbidden to mention the stock market even though it's you know it's dropping like a rock. Yeah, um, so, so I don't want to be a, um, a panda hugger. So, so I'm going to be cautious in what, I, what, I, what I'm going to comment on. Uh, so you've you, you got to realize that China is a one-party system. A, a one-party system care the most is about whether the people uh, are thinking alike or differently. Uh, different information, free, freedom of information doesn't help in that, in that scenario. A lot of our technology companies in the Silicon Valley had trouble getting into China or staying in there, you know, between Google and Facebook and a bunch of people. That was the whole real, real reason uh, behind it. You know, does that mean that they aren't doing, uh, does that mean that's the right thing? In my opinion, I don't think so. Uh, I think everybody should have the right to think about or know everything and to make their own, draw their own conclusion. But given the circumstances um, um, that you know, they believe that's the best thing to do is not, is not to create unrest. This dissatisfaction, discontent, and unrest. And so, uh, you know, you and I may do it a little differently. We're overly, you know, thinking about this side, this side of the system. Uh, they, they, they chose to do it that way. Uh, will they loosen up and open up in the future? I think they will. Um, but the time frame uh, might be a little longer than you and I like. Um, and that's what, you know, I have a lot of friends in media uh, having a lot of troubles uh, either getting in and, or even getting visa revoked, um, and as you pointed out. Not, not the best of situation, but you also understand about why they are you know, putting this kind of a, the iron fist down. 
um, China is going through, for whatever reason it might be, they're going through the anti-corruption movement. Um, the reason might be consolidation of power, I read that. I, um, you know, get rid of the people that you don't like, I read that. Uh, uh, but, uh, but the end result is great. We want to have a very much more transparent China. Uh, where not, you know, people under, under table stuff and, you know, that, that really will hurt the economy and hurt the, the young people chances. So I, I'm looking for the positive end results of this. The process could be painful to watch um, and the process could be something that the, our Western standard um, have trouble dealing with. And uh, in our pre call before uh, uh, earlier in the week, you described to China that a lot of Westerners and Americans um, are not really clued into, that there's more internal debate um, than uh, you know, everything looks monolithic from the outside, but the internal debate is really pretty raucous uh, about whether, you know, should we put the accelerator on, uh, you know, favoring the entrepreneurial side of the economy, the Xiaomi's, the Alibaba's the 10 cents, or is it time to recalibrate and give a boost to the state-owned enterprise because inefficient as they may be, they employ a lot of people. Um, and, and, and so, uh, d describe that. Well, yeah, I, 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 I mean, um, you look at a, a country that in the last 35 years had tremendously transformed itself uh, economically, socially, um, uh, in some way, culturally. Um, so, if you sit back and think about that, could it be everything is random or reactive on the short term? It couldn't possibly be. I mean, just, that would have been a miracle of chances. You know, it'd be, it'd be easier to, to win you know, a number of uh, lottery tickets in a row. Um, it, it, just, it just couldn't possibly be. So, you know, they are, and, and also, I, like you, know a number of, um, you, you know, uh, decision makers um, in, in the Chinese uh, um, uh, government and the Communist Party. Uh, these are very well-trained, <laughs> top of the line, you know, smarter than most people we met, um, extremely under, well understood of, of global, Western, Eastern, the dynamics, I can possibly by chance, uh, and I'm sure that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing are well discussed, well debated and stuff. The only one thing it is, again, again it's a one party system, uh, you know, unlike that, unlike that every night we turn in, you know, Fox News versus MSNBC, you have, you have two versions of the same thing. Uh, there ain't no two versions of the same thing. Uh, so once they decide it, it'll be one version of the, that, that one thing. And so that's what we're seeing in the Western world. It's not, it's not as dictatorial as people would think it, it is. That, but when they come out, they are a little bit more united. Well, thanks for that perspective. I interrupted this fascinating discussion on the Internet of Things, but I, but I know that China's on everyone's mind right now. We do have time for a question or two uh, before we conclude. Um, uh, so next, next question. Hey, John, not to go back to the handset business, but going back to the handset business, I'm curious if you can talk about what, <coughs> pardon me, what you think your customers want today from a handset. Are Google services important? Can you do Google services under the same kind of structure you've had, or would you have to run a different kernel? Notice how I avoided saying Android. Um, well, if I answer that question, I might as well answer the earlier question. Sure. Uh, but, uh, but thank you for the question. Um, I, let me, maybe I'll answer the following way. Uh, I think we made very, very good phones. Uh, you know, we have two phones uh, uh, since I joined that I feel very, very proud of. Um, um, by the way, by omission doesn't mean I'm not proud of the rest of the phones, so, so please. Um, but um, the Passport and the Classic um, for their own reason. Um, we interview, you know, I, by all that, by any definitions, uh, it's not a runaway success, okay? And it's it, not bad, but it's not a runaway success. Um, so we interview the users um, and, and, and try to understand, you know, what's, what, what's important to them. 
and, and it was like five different criteria and all that security and all this stuff. The one thing that was important to them was application. Uh, and we don't have a lot. We have a deal with Amazon. It runs the Amazon apps, uh, uh, app, app stores. It, we, you know, BlackBerry has our own app stores, but it's not competitive uh, to the Google Play or the um, uh, iPhone, iTunes store, so for example. So, um, so we're working hard at that. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it as that. Um, it's a lot more uh, complex than most people would give it credit to. Because if it's not, if, this is one of those the Communist Party com, uh, uh, answer. Let me put it this way. Uh, given the fact that I already acknowledged it, uh, and you know me long enough to, you know, it's not like I'm sitting, sitting in my office practicing putting. Uh, since I already acknowledged it, um, you know, obviously I, I, I'm working hard at it. So it's a little bit more complex why it is not done. So, um, so and in due time, I, I would explain that. Oh, you could remind me of that. Uh, last question. Oh. <laughs> um, John, thanks for coming in your hectic schedule. And Rich, I hope you have a speedy recovery soon. Thank you. Um, now, your company has 44,000 patents and was probably one of the best in the security area. And have and with the proliferation of Internet of Things, probably you can license it to make money. Have you considered using it like what IBM has been doing um, that would directly hit the bottom line using your intellectual property? Yes. Um, I've not only considered, uh, we, we have started the process. Um, we have a cross, um, uh, cross licensing on all patents with Cisco. Uh, last quarter, so um, and uh, and Mr. Chambers was nice enough to give me a little bit of money uh, on that. Um, so yes, we we, we this is one of the things that I wanted to do is to be able to license uh, our patent. Um, and this is a very tricky area. Um, but those of you who are in the legal business, you know, you don't want. We definitely will not be, and don't want, don't ever want to be a troll. Okay. So that's, we have every ability to become that because of our 44,000 patents. And a lot of our patents are LTE-based patents. So you know, um, it's called the essential patents in the, in the telecommunication world. Um, so, but that's not a good, you know, that, that's definitely a bad business to be in, in my personal opinion. Being an engineer myself, I don't want to do that at all, okay? On the other hand, we should get, um, we should be able to, have people pay for using our technology, and they should be encouraged to use our technology. So th there lies the how aggressive are you going to be uh, at that licensing business, for example. And um, uh, IBM has a good balance on that, uh, like you pointed out. And I think that that's a good model to have. Um, that then, if you want to go through that model, it takes time. Because that model is really engineers to engineers sitting down really trying to figure out what the designs are and, and how you could use it and deploy it and, um, and protect other people's invention and stuff. So it's a, it's a time consuming model, but it, that's the right model to be at. But thank you. Well, thank you, John. I always feel in talking to you that uh, we, you're always willing to pull back the curtain and uh, tell us how you think about the decisions you've made. Drive my, drive my PR people crazy. Yeah, I, I could see the grimace looks on the PR people. You had to see it. Uh, occasionally flashing up, but uh, thank you for uh, a really entertaining and educational hour. Well, no, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I always like chatting with you. So, well, speedy recovery. Yeah. Don't, thank don't, you. Stand, thank don't you. stand up. And now comes the ceremonial presentation of the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Please, Thank you. please wear that in very good health. I uh, really appreciate your candor, and I hope that you, I believe that all of us in the room have found this a most productive start to our day. Uh, a recording of this program will be available soon on our YouTube channel, where you'll find recordings of most of other Churchill Club programs also. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. <laughs>